very interesting speech <laughs> that he made in Davos uh, about 10 days ago. Uh, I read a few words about it from the newspaper last week, but I don't think even that did it justice. I've been ruminating on it um, for a further week. It was this speech about moral capitalism, which seemed to me to go to the heart of what's wrong <coughs> with the Conservative Party today. It's this idea that the state can intervene and the state can be uh, can be there to moderate or temper market forces and that we don't have to live in a nasty world where people make profits at the expense of others. This, to me, is, is an anathema. I remember Enoch saying to me, probably 25 years ago when I first met him, that profit is a wonderful thing. You don't tax a loss, you only tax a profit. We're all in it together. And in this recent financial crisis, which I would not seek to play down or indeed to underestimate, it does seem that the people who make money, the capitalists, the real genuine wealth creators, have made some pretty desperate mistakes, and I'd be the first to condemn them for that. But scapegoating them for something which is only partly their fault is not the way forward. Now, I can understand why Gordon Brown and his lackeys in the Labour government blame the bank is because actually it's more their fault than the bankers' fault. <coughs> and it's very helpful if you are Gordon Brown or Alistair Darling or any of the nameless uh, non-entities who run the Labour government to say that Fred the Shred or Sir Tom McKillop or any of these other people who are formerly very wealthy merchant bankers or retail bankers should take the blame for the mistakes made by the Labour government. We know why this went wrong. It was because Gordon Brown, when he was Chancellor, decided to try and imitate what Alan Greenspan recklessly was doing in America, which was to pump enormous amounts of additional money into the system, and in a, in a futile attempt to make people wealthy. Now, we all know, because we're all Mr. and proper economists, we all understand that if you only make people wealthy by genuinely creating wealth, printing money, putting money into circulation, is an illusion of wealth. It doesn't actually make anybody richer than they were. And the enormous number of impoverished people who used to be rich and used to work around here will stand uh, testimony to that particular assertion. But between the years, I think, 2001 and 2007, Brown grew the money supply in the M4 measure at 14% per annum. This was at a time when inflation was <coughs> about 2% and growth was 2 or 2.5%. Two so it was getting off 10% more than the combined rates of growth and inflation. And any A-level economics student, even under this dire government education system, <laughs> should be able to tell you that growing the money supply at that rate and excessive rate of inflation is only going to have one result, and it's the result that we're seeing now. Anyway, Brown tried to do that, um, tried to emulate Greenspan. And if you're a banker, you're in business to make money, nothing wrong with that. And you suddenly realize that the money markets are awash with cash. And not just a wash with cash, but because it's a wash with cash, the cash is quite cheap. And so what do you do? You think, well, I better borrow some of this money, because I'm a banker, I'm in business to make money, and I'll lend it on to somebody else. The trouble is, you soon run out of people who are good risks to lend to. And so you start lending that money in large quantities to people who haven't got a prayer of paying it back. Well, that in a very simplistic form is, is, is what's gone wrong. But while, while you can see it is the fault of the bankers for being reckless, let's ask ourselves who put the money into circulation in the first place? And who regulated the banks so badly after 1997? They were able to do this. They were able to have business plans that were technically insane. And to cause all this trouble, it was, of course, the Labour government. Now, if we lived in a perfect world, which sadly we don't, the Conservative opposition would be up on its hind legs day after day pointing this out, but it can't, because even though it has already plumbed depths of hypocrisy unseen, in my opinion, since the end of Stalin's Russia, uh, it doesn't want to admit that all those years when it said we will share the proceeds of growth and we will match Labour's spending plans, all the years that it did that, it was wrong. Not just morally wrong, as we conservatives believe that public spending is not good in itself, but wrong because they too were conned by this notion that Labour had created a prosperous society. They were conned into believing that there really was a huge amount of money out there that we could go on spending in the public sector at a reckless rate, that we could create, sustain, and uh, make flourish Gordon Brown's client state. 
and that there would always be the money to pay for it. And so when it all went pear-shaped last year, little George Osborne, on a rare visit from Deripaska's yacht, back, <laughs> into, back, into the real, back into the real world, said to himself, hang on a minute, that money isn't there after all. So we no longer were able to talk about sharing the proceeds of growth because as some of us had confidently predicted for some years, there was no growth of which to share the proceeds. It's even worse than that, of course. The Conservative Party has had to start to row back from its pledge to match Labour spending plans. Even it, again on a rare visit from Mr. Deripaska's yacht, has had to agree that Labour spending plans are unsustainable and insane at a time when we are heading for deflation and when people, the last thing that people like us need or anyone in this country needs is to have to have a higher burden of tax to pay for Labour's clientele. Yeah. Now, that's a start, and it's a start that I would encourage. But I'm waiting in particular for Dave or little George <laughs> to say two things. <coughs> First of all, I want them to say that they will not support and not sustain and not allow to flourish Gordon Brown's climate state. Between seven and 800,000 people have been put on the public payroll in this country since 1997. Now, I am not going to stand here as the Labour Party would put up like any Conservative to do and say that we should be sacking doctors, nurses, teachers, uh, firemen, people who look after the elderly in care homes. I don't believe that for a moment. Uh, I do believe that in a society such as ours, the state has a compassionate role and it is to educate and it is to look after people who cannot look after themselves. So let me be quite clear about that. I'm not talking about sacking any of those 700 or 800,000 people who are doing what we might define as socially useful, productive and compassionate jobs. I am talking about sacking the sort of people who are paid 45 or 50,000 pounds a year to drive around in their company cars, the waiting rooms of doctors' surgeries in certain areas, to go into poor unsuspecting patients who are queuing up to see their doctor and to tell them that they should be eating five portions of fruit and vegetables a day. <laughs> because believe me, such posts exist. And if I can remember what they were, there are even more absurd posts than that. And not only are they highly remunerated and given company cars, but they have people to whom they report who are paid even more and are presumably given even bigger company cars. Now, I have said to people in the Conservative Channel Cabinet in recent times, why do you feel it is your duty to sustain jobs like that? And they say, well, we can't go around saying we want to sack people for the public payroll because they won't vote for us. Well, I'm sorry, I've got news for you. They're not going to vote for you anyway. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Anybody who is a client of Gordon Brown's has loyalty to the client master, and that is Gordon Brown, and they will vote for him come hell or high water. Because they know that Gordon Brown won't sack them. I mean, after all, the reason we're in this appalling mess is that Gordon Brown has refused to cut public and has refused to shed these useless and socially unproductive jobs from the public sector. So they know very well that if they support him, uh, they, they are more likely to stay in Clover than if they vote Conservatives, because there is just a small chance that a Conservative government might say that somebody who is paid a lot of money to drive around <coughs> doctor surgeries, hectoring people in waiting rooms about eating five quarters of fruit and vegetables a day, um, uh, that might not be a terribly socially productive job. So they won't vote for them anyway, but that isn't actually the entire point. The first time I ever went to a party conference, it was at Blackpool, the week before the Brighton bomb in 1984. And I remember standing at the back of the uh, ballroom in the Winter Gardens in Blackpool and seeing Arthur Scargill make um, the most terrifying speech. I never saw Scargill speak in public apart from on that occasion. And one realized that he truly was, and just had to call him the enemy within. Um, this was a speech in which he said, and I paraphrased it 25 years ago, my recall is not exact, we've seen Margaret Thatcher fight for her class. All I want to do is fight for mine. I'm here fighting for my class. Well, I wouldn't wish to be considered a Scargillite, but I do believe it's probably time that the Conservative Party started not necessarily fighting for its class, because I didn't set that Marxist analysis of class-based uh, class or class-divided society but certainly it should be fighting for its natural constituency. And its natural constituency are extremely hardworking, decent people who pay a great deal of money in tax and wouldn't mind being able to decide how they could spend a bit more of that money and be given freedom to do so.